Hi, I'm Miles. I am the BDFL of Jump. I also work at Hudson River Trading, but today I'm speaking in, in a personal capacity, and I'm happy to tell you about uh, the state of Jump. Um, so most people in this room probably know what Jump is, um, but maybe not everyone on YouTube. So Jump is an algebraic modeling language. It is part of what we call the zoo of algebraic modeling languages. There's quite a number of packages that do something very similar, similar to Jump. CVXPy and PyOMO are pretty well known in the Python world. Uh, GAMS, AMPL, AIMS are uh, used traditionally in the operations research world. Uh, but there's quite a large variety of packages that, that do algebraic modeling. Um, and what algebraic modeling is means that you write down some code that defines an optimization problem. Um, and this algebraic modeling language handles the translation of the math that you wrote down into whatever data structures or, or code that's needed to actually run some, um, some optimization algorithm, and it gives you the answer back. So here we have defined um, decision variables x uh, and residuals. We add some linear constraints, um, and we add an objective. And here you can see, hopefully pretty easily, that we're writing a least squared regressions problem where the regression coefficients are defined to be within uh, 0 to 1 and sum to 1. So this is um, a constrained optimization problem. We hand it off to IPOPT. We optimize. We get the solution back, and we return the value. So this is like jump in, in a nutshell. Um, what makes jump interesting? Um, nice syntax. So. Because we're in Julia, we get to use these, uh, this feature called macros, uh, which lets us, if I go back, um, this at variable, at constraint, at objective, lets us play around with the syntax and let you write something a bit more uh, mathematical than you would if you were just writing uh, plain code. Um, so that's a feature of Julia. Um, comprehensive documentation, we've been working on this pretty hard uh, for the past couple of years, um, and now we're pretty proud of it, although there's definitely always room for, for improvement. Um, the community, as evidenced by the, this workshop today and all the discussions that happen online pretty frequently, um, Jump is open source, um, so you can use it uh, have, however you like following the license. Um, it's solver independent. We now list uh, more than 40 solvers that you can connect to when you're using Jump. Um, it's embedded in Julia, so usually when you're actually solving an optimization problem, um, you want to do more than just solve that one optimization problem. You might want to solve a lot of them in a loop. You might have some data processing. You might have some other logic. A lot of other things happen than just solving the optimization problem. And being in a language, a full, fully featured programming language like Julia, is very convenient um, for doing the rest of what, what you want to do besides just solving an optimization problem. Um, Jump supports interacting with solvers while they're running. So this is a relatively advanced feature, but one that's uh, pretty useful nonetheless. Um, you can basically interact with the optimization algorithm in a way that, for example, lets you implicitly define constraints instead of enumerating constraints, just as one example. Um, another thing is Jump has low overhead for model generation. This is one of the original selling points of Jump. Um, compared to Python languages, Python-based libraries 10 years ago when we made these comparisons, but we're still working pretty hard to keep the model generation time under control. Finally, Jump is uh, extensible to new solvers. So uh, like we have 40 solvers connected. We didn't uh, interface all of those. A lot of them were contributed by the community, and it's meant to be um, very extensible. Oh, and now finally, um, it's extensible to new problem classes. So we'll hear other talks during this this workshop about how people have extended Jump in in interesting ways. Um, so Jump is developed by quite a large team. Um, this slide is is a reminder for myself to mention that a lot of what I'm t most of what I'm talking about are not things that I implemented myself. I'm like the spokes spokesman, but um, a lot of, most of what I'm going to cover has been done by, um, well, Oscar in big part, Benoit, and the whole rest of the core developers, plus 
uh, uh, hundreds, more than 100 uh, contributors that we have to, to jump. Um, so just to give some um, quantitative uh, indications of how jump is doing, so this is a plot of um, number of pull requests that have been opened against the jump repositories over time. Um, the slope of the line is interesting. It's basically how many new pull requests do we get in a given period. And we can, if we look between 2022 and 2023, there's looks like about 1,500 new pull requests um, over that time period. So that's quite a lot of activity happening. Um, and another uh, quantity that we like to look at is the number of um, unique users who have contributed to Jump. So we, we don't just want Jump to be um, done by a small number of people. We want, uh, like, we want a low barrier to contribution. So this line shows the total number of unique uh, users who have opened the pull request, and that's pretty steadily increasing. So we do have a, uh, a good flow of new people contributing to the project. So um, if you haven't opened up a pull request, you can be included in, in this line next year. Um, open issues by package. This, this one tells a bit of a story. Um, so you can see um, Jump accumulated open issues for quite a while, up until uh, 2020. We had a small uh, dip in um, before 2018 when we merged uh, MathOp interface, but that was a relatively small dip, and we just kind of kept going out of control for, for a while. Um, then we hired uh, Oscar through the NSF grant, um, and um, we've done a lot of work to keep this under, under control and like um, manage our backlog of issues. Um, and this is kind of a, this is a cartoon of, uh, of kind of technology development. Uh, it's not a perfect fit, but I want to see if we can uh, kind of impose the, the jump story on this cartoon. Um, so the peak of inflated expectations might be at the point where we decided we need to rewrite everything. So that was in 2017, um, after jump had been around for a few years, we got a steady stream of feature requests. How do we do this? How do we do that? Um, like people were coming to jump and asking us to do things, and we realized that the code could not do what we wanted it to do. So we decided to rewrite everything. Um, then maybe the trough is at the point we, where we reached 500 open issues, um, and it, it's a lot, lot to manage, but in that period we did rewrite everything. Um, and maybe today my opinion is we're in a transition between, between this uh, slope of enlightenment and pr uh, plateau of productivity, so we are um, still developing new features, adding new things, but in a kind of cautious and conservative way and in a way that uh, is actually useful for people. So a few milestones from the past year. Between July 2022 and July 2023, um, we've released, uh, gone from version 1.1 to 1.12. Maybe 1.13 will happen today if, if someone merges it. Um, uh, but we're very close to that. Two of the four major roadmap items have been completed. Um, number of supported solvers increased from 37 to 43. Uh, the Jump 1.0 paper was published, so if you're citing Jump, we have a new paper for you to cite. Uh, Jump uh, is now a registered trademark, the, the logo, so this helps us protect uh, Jump from um, anyone who might be using the name in a confusing way. Um, we may, you might hear more about that, but for now we can just put the, that R mark next to jump. Um, we have some attention from the major commercial players. I won't say more on this, but uh, if you've been following social media, you, you might know what's been going on. Um, we also had our uh, first jump baby by one of the um, original developers of jump, and maybe we'll have more as the years go on. Um, OK, in terms of technical improvements, I want to cover a few that, that you should know about. Um, 
multi-objective support, complex number support, generic number support, improved documentation, and reduced time to first solve. So multi-objective support um, is easy to explain. It was harder to actually get into jump in, an, in a nice and clean way. Um, so the syntax now is uh, pretty straightforward. You define your variables. You define your constraints. Um, you can also define expressions. And when you go to set the objective, you can set uh, provide a list of expressions that specify the objective. Um, and this defines a multi-objective optimization problem. You have to use a special solver to do this, uh, to, hand, to solve this problem. I won't go into the math there. Um, and what happens is that you um, say optimize, and then we, when you go to query your solution, you will uh, you may be returned a list of multiple solvers. Each of those solvers has an objective value for each objective. And if you, uh, hopefully, um, if you're using the right algorithm, these will be Pareto optimal points. Um, so this is a nice story about how this is a feature that was developed originally external to Jump in an extension. And over time, we uh, eventually inter integrated it into Jump. And now it's a first class, has first class support. Complex number support um, is another thing that we recently added. Um, so this is a little tricky. What happens when you add a variable in the complex plane is you get an affine expression back. And that affine expression is the sum of uh, two different variables, or the real component and the imaginary component. Um, so under the hood, jump creates two different variables. And we allow um, complex coefficients in these affine expressions. Uh, so you see it's a complex, it's a, a fine expression where the coefficients are complex numbers. Um, and what you can do is then plug this into your favorite um, optimization problem that needs complex num numbers. I've actually don't know much about complex numbers and optimization problems, but a lot of people like this. So what you can do is um, define uh, Hermitian uh, constraints on Hermitian matrices. Um, um, like you would do for in real coefficients, write down the problem, you say solve, and you get the answer back. Uh, so that's complex numbers. Um, they're useful. The biggest application I know is in um, AC, powerful, AC PowerFlow, um, but there are numerous other applications uh, in kind of physics and engineering. Uh, generic number support is actually sounds very uh, similar to complex number support, but it's an entirely different feature. Uh, we historically jump has assumed that coefficients are, are floating point numbers or uh, complex expressions of floating point numbers. Um, what we can do now is take a generic uh, parameter. So here you can provide a create a generic model, provide big float. And what that does is um, within the model, all the coefficients are big floats, and the variables are return values as big floats. Um, so you use jump, you write, you define your variable. You can use uh, this like square root, square root of a big two that gives you the square root of two in, in high precision. Um, and you can toss, toss that to your solver and get a high precision answer back. So that's pretty cool. Um, this also works for rational numbers, uh, which is useful for uh, if you're maybe proving theorems and you really, really, really want to know the exact value of a linear programming problem, uh, you can specify it in rational numbers, uh, hand it off to a specialized solver, and get the answer back in rational arithmetic. Uh, so this is a long-standing feature that we very recently emerged and will go out in the next version of Jump. Improved documentation. So there's been seven new tutorials. We've integrated solver readmes into the documentation, which was a big uh, coordination effort. Uh, many miscellaneous improvements I won't list. Um, and if you go to the documentation and look at the PDF, it's over 1,000 pages. So there's a lot of documentation there. Um, and we're continuously improving it, but this is one of the, the big efforts in the past year. Time to first solve. OK, so um, in the Julia world, there's this problem called time to first plot, uh, or time to first whatever you want to do. 
Um, in jump, we call this time to first solve. So when you start up Julia, and let's just say you're uh, defining a problem uh, with two variables, two constraints, you call optimize. This should be very, very fast. You just have like two variables and two constraints. Um, if you run this on Julia 1.7, it takes 10.5 seconds on my laptop, um, which is kind of slow. But the kind of the explanation that Julia users are very familiar with is the first time you run something, it's JIT compiling. The second time, it'll be very fast. Uh, we know that story, but it's also kind of annoying to wait 10 seconds the first time you solve the problem. So in Julia 1.9, this is now down to half a second. Um, this thanks to a lot of improvements um, on the Julia side that we've uh, hooked into from Jump. Um, there's still some compilation time. It may be, I mean, in terms of solving this problem, it's maybe milliseconds, so there's still compilation overhead the first time, but there's a pretty big usability difference going from 10 seconds to half a second. Um, a few other things that you should maybe be aware of. There was a big refactoring for, for nonlinear programming, um, moving a lot of that functionality into the MathOpt interface package. This is um, in preparation for bigger refactoring uh, that, that's happening soon. Uh, in terms of debugging, we have functions uh, for relaxing constraints and turning them into uh, penalized, uh, putting relaxing constraints, moving them into the objective with a penalty printing bridges, debugging what's going on with bridges. Um, in terms of usability, we can now slice a sparse access array. Um, we have easy conversions to data frames. We can fix uh, discrete variables. So what a uh, common request is I'm solving a mixed integer optimization problem. Um, now I want to fix the values at their integer, fix the variables at their integer values, resolve that as a linear program, and query the duals. Um, this fixed discrete variables helps you do that. Uh, reified constraints is a syntax that we've added support for um, in our support for, uh, which helps us add support for constraint programming. Um, vector valued inequality syntax is, uh, is a change that lets you write like AX greater than or equal to B, um, and that will generate a vector constraint um, as opposed to AX dot greater than or equal to B, which generates a list of scalar constraints. So a uh, slightly different syntax that's useful in some situations. Um, who is citing jump? So if you saw my talk last year, um, I gave a bit of an analysis of what fields are citing jump and what they're using it for. Um, I'm not, this year I want to be more qualitative, so I took the uh, 1,200 citations on Semantic Scholar and made a word cloud. Um, so optimal kind of makes sense, um, and it shows you the major fields that are using jump, so power, control, energy, systems, uh, markets, electricity, hydrogen shows up there, COVID, a um, lot of interesting things, robust planning, yeah, lots of um, words, maybe not too surprising, but I'd say at least shows like power, control, um, energy shows like the, the big influence of jump in energy applications. Um, I also wanted to pick a few papers that um, just had very interesting titles. Um, policy making for oil imports by United Nature, Nations countries using a mixed, uh, using a multi-objective mixed integer linear programming approach. That's pretty cool. Uh, mixed integer linear, linear programming for grain shipment in the Black Sea. Um, Unfortunately, I don't know what's going to happen in the Black Sea, but it's cool that people can use Jump to uh, make plans there. Um, Multi-robot assembly scheduling for the Lunar Crater radio telescope on the far side of the moon. That's pretty cool. <laughs> um, they're actually using Jump to analyze a proposed telescope plan, um, basically analyze the construction plans for a proposed telescope on the far side of the moon. Um, and continuous time formulation of optimal task scheduling, quality service assurance, and nanosatellites. So if you're in the in aerospace world, uh, people are, are using Jump for pretty cool things. Um, simulation and design of passive residual heat removal system for uh, advanced temperature nuclear, uh, vent, advanced temperature, temperature advanced reactor. Um, this is actually a nuclear reactor, so people are, use Jump to um, design this heat removal system, uh, which is part of a big engineering problem for bringing the, this 
class of nuclear reactors into practice. Um, and then a few more, uh, more traditional OR type applications, um, continent scale inventory routing, um, policy analytics in public schools, simulation and optimization package for emergency medical services. Um, so all this is pretty cool. Like while we're here talking about syntax, fixing bugs, connecting to solvers, people are, are um, actually like using what we're doing for uh, planning telescopes on the far side of the moon. So have to, you have to be pretty proud of that. Um, in terms of plans for the next year, it's a short list, but this is actually a, a pretty major point. Uh, the new nonlinear interface is probably our biggest item to, to handle in the next year and will probably be tied to Jump 2.0. Um, there are definitely more things that we can add to the list and more things that will come out of the discussions at the workshop this week, but nonlinear interface is, is a big thing. And with that, I will thank everyone and looking forward to the rest of the workshop. So we have uh, a few minutes uh, for questions, plenty of uh, questions. And the way this is going to work is uh, we're going to ask the question and then for the stream, I might ask that Miles kind of restates the question so that we can hear it uh, on YouTube in the future. So any questions uh, from the room? Jean-François. So uh, maybe I will be the devil advocate, but uh, how much breaking stuff do you expect to be in uh, Jump to the Okay, so the question is, what do we expect to break in, in Jump 2.0? Um, it's still TBD to be determined, but I would guess um, mostly things, anything that we need to break or want to break for the new nonlinear interface. Um, there might my, be a couple other things we have in my, mind. My plan is to try and get as much of the nonlinear in without breaking anything. So my hope is that we don't need to do it. 2.0, but we'll see how that goes. Yeah, but um, if we do 2.0, it would be because of the nonlinear changes, so the changes should be restricted to that, but maybe there's a few things that have been annoying us and we want to change also. Yeah, um, like looking at the drafts for the nonlinear, uh, changes I've seen that there's parameter support. Is that specific to the nonlinear changes, or is that something that will come to the linear and quadratic stuff as well? Maybe <laughs> this is turning into a uh, question and answer for me rather than uh, for Miles. So the question was uh, in the so the, there's always been nonlinear parameters in Jump. You can use the at nl parameter macro, uh, and recently we added uh, a new parameter set to MOI uh, with the view to maybe supporting parameters in linear and quadratic functions as well. Uh, there's actually maybe even a talk uh, in the next couple of minutes that will be uh, maybe delving into that. Uh, so it's kind of on, on the roadmap, but no concrete plans. There's a lot of other symbolic stuff going on in Julia right now, so like symbolic GLs, uh, symbolic details, that kind of stuff. Has there been any thought of trying to, um, you know, maybe unify or make compatible uh, some of the stuff that's going on in, in Jump with the other symbolic stuff? So the, the question was, uh, there's a lot of other symbolic stuff in Julia, symbolics.jl, and a plenty of other things. I would encourage you to come tomorrow to listen to my talk where I might actually go into more detail on the nonlinear interface and how it actually uh, interfaces with some of the symbolic stuff uh, and why we've chosen the design we've chosen. So maybe I'll ask that we hold that uh, for tomorrow. Any other questions or should we all uh, give Miles another round of applause?